Hi, and welcome back. The way we consume television shows, movies has changed significantly over the last couple of years, and we are inundated with choices and options. There's a lot of costs associated with all the different streaming sites and devices we need um, and service providers out there. So we're going to start with the traditional options. Having cable come in, what does cable cost these days? We're going to look at some free alternatives that you may wish to explore or learn some more about. Then we'll talk about the paid streaming services that are currently available. Uh, we'll go over a lot of the popular ones and then some specialty ones that you may or may not have heard of before. We'll talk about the different devices you need to be able to stream. We'll talk about smart TVs. We'll talk about streaming devices like Amazon Fire Sticks and Roku and things like that. And finally, we'll end up with some other services that you may have heard about. We'll go over the pros and the cons and the law as far as things like IPTV and Android boxes are concerned. We'll start with what internet packages cost and what cable packages cost. Uh, I'll get out of the way in a second so you can see the whole screen. Uh, what I've done is I've taken the three big providers and just given a breakdown of what they are currently charging. Um, the first couple of lines go over internet pricing. So if you just want internet service and the other two listings are if you want internet service and TV service. I'll just shrink myself down real small. And you can see that for some places like Rogers, for example, uh, the cost to get internet service and versus internet and TV service, the difference is only about $40 a month. And when we go through some of the streaming packages and talk about adding in Netflix and um, Amazon Video and Crave and some of these other things, it may be worth keeping cable just because it's easier. Uh, cable, you have customer service, you click your remote, your TV goes on, you know how the, the channel guide works, uh, you have access to the channels that you want. And while we all are interested in cutting the cable and getting away from paying the cable bill, in some instances, it may be your best option. The numbers on these graphs may be confusing. Uh, the, the cost is pretty straightforward, but then there is a speed number, 50 megabytes a second, 50 megabytes a second, two and a half gigabytes per second. If all of this seems like nonsense and gibberish to you, don't worry, I'll explain what all these numbers mean. And before moving on, I wanted to shed some light on a program that Rogers offers and MindForward has partnered with them to offer to um, those who qualify. Uh, the Connect for Success program offers subsidized internet, TV, and mobile access um, to people on ODSP, Ontario Works, etc. If you qualify for this program, it is definitely worth taking advantage of because you're saving about 90% off of what these services typically cost. If you're interested, speak to your case manager. Case managers have been educated on how to access the program or feel free to give Rogers a call yourself. Now on that other slide, we were talking about internet speeds. And you may wonder, how much speed do I actually need? Do we need hundreds of gigabytes a second in internet speed? Well, the easy answer is no, you don't. Uh, what we've got listed here is a breakdown of what typical video streaming takes up in internet use. Uh, five megabytes a second to watch Netflix. Uh, if you're playing a lot of video games online, it's eight to 10 megabytes a second. YouTube watches about five megabytes a second for a video. If you're using Zoom, that's about three megabytes a second. 
So what you'll notice is that you don't need a ton of internet speed to stream video. Now, if you have a 4K TV, which is a newer television that gets that super high definition, 25 megabytes a second to watch the, that kind of TV. Um, so if you do have those kind of devices and you watch a lot of 4K TV, you may consider higher internet speeds. Um, those large packages that give you 500 megabytes a second or two and a half gigabytes a second, they're designed for people who upload a lot of content. So if you do Twitch, if you know what Twitch is and you're, you're streaming your video game playing, or you have a YouTube channel and you're uploading a lot of videos, or you have a house full of people with the brand new video game systems that live for blowing things up with their video games. Those are the folks that those bigger packages are aimed at. Personally, in my house, I get a package that's 100 megabytes a second. And I have two teenage boys that play video games, multiple mobile devices, and TVs going, and Zoom calls going. And we have never had an issue with internet in this house. So 100 megabytes, 150 megabytes a second, is all you really need to be paying for. Everything on top of that is just bragging rights. In another video I've done, I've talked about Wi-Fi speeds and why speeds may be slower in your house. Um, the further away your device is from the router, which is the device that brings internet into your house, the slower the signal will be. So if your router's in your basement, and you're finding that you can't stream Netflix on the TV upstairs, it may be because it's far, it's too far away from the router. Wi-Fi signals don't work very well through walls and through pipes and around your electrical panel and things like this. So watch the other video to for tips on how to improve your Wi-Fi signal. The other thing you can do is a lot of TVs you can wire directly into what we call hard wiring or using an Ethernet cable where you would plug your router directly into your TV. You may need a technician or someone handy to run some cables, but it's a way to ensure that your full speed is going to the device you want to watch TV on. When in doubt, there's something called a Google speed test you can do. It, it tests how fast your internet speed is. Go to Google and type in speed test and it'll pop right up. There's a blue button you can hit. It'll run the speed test and it'll tell you exactly how fast your internet is. And then it'll even give you a breakdown and say your speed is good enough to watch this many videos or 4k gaming or whatever. Gives you a full breakdown so there's no questions left unanswered. If you've heard me chat before, you know free is my favorite. So I'm always looking for free options to offer out to people as opposed to some of the paid ones. And this is just a little list. It's certainly not exhaustive of some free options that are worth checking out. My personal favorite on this one is something called Libby. It's actually an app that is associated through your library and you use your library card with Libby to get access to all kinds of videos and TV shows. A lot of these options have apps that you can download either onto your smart TV or onto a streaming device, which will allow you to access their content. So these antennas are not like they were a long time ago where we had the rabbit ears on our TVs and we wrap tinfoil around them to try to get the hockey game to come in a little clearer. Digital antennas are unique in that you either get the signal or you don't. And if you get the signal, it's in full high definition. They're great. And in the area where Mind Forward operates, the Halton and Peel areas especially, these antennas work really great because we're so close to Lake Ontario. Depending on the type of antenna that you put up and how you orient it, uh, you can pick up signals across Lake Ontario from Buffalo. You can get 
signals from Toronto and from Hamilton. And on average, you can pick up between 10 and 30 TV channels through one of these antennas. Uh, they're available through Amazon, and there are some electronic stores in Mississauga that do sell these. And the stores that sell them, you can go in, check them out, see how many channels they pull, and decide if it's something that you want. When it comes to paid options for video streaming, you have an unlimited number of options available to you. I've given a breakdown here of some of the more popular options, Crave, Amazon, YouTube, Disney, Paramount, and Netflix. Uh, what has changed over the last little while is a lot of these options have various price points now. Uh, if you want the full 4K experience, they're usually in the $20 range. Uh, whereas if you want ad supported content, which means you'll get commercials interrupting your shows, there's usually a lesser price point around $10 to $12. So depending what you want to spend, there's usually an option that'll fit your bill. One thing I'll say as we're talking about these paid apps, keep in mind that none of these have a cancellation cost or a startup cost associated with them. And what I mean is if you're a fan of one of these, but maybe you've seen all the content and you want to try a different one, feel free to cancel your Netflix subscription, for example, for a couple of months and pick up another, pick up Crave TV and give it a try. And if you find that you don't like the content or you get tired of it quickly, then cancel it and go back to a different one. You don't have to keep them all going and because the cost is going to get very high very quickly. Uh, if we go on vacation, my family, and we know we're going to be out of town for a month, we'll cancel our subscription for that month because we're not going to be home to use it. Outside of the, the big players in this space, there are many, many specialty options based on your interests. And that's really what this whole internet streaming television thing has opened up to us. Um, the network TV shows had to please everybody when there was only five or six networks to choose from. Nowadays, if all you care about is British comedies, you can get a streaming service that just shows British comedies. It's called BritBox. Uh, if you're a fan of Discovery Channel or um, documentary style programs, there are streaming sites that serve that need. If you're a fan of sports and you pay for cable because you only want to watch the Leafs or you only care about sports during tennis season and then you don't care anymore, you can pick up TSN or Sportsnet and pay for the months you want it and then stop it. To stream any of these services, you need the device to stream it on. And most TVs that you can purchase now are considered smart TVs, meaning they have a computer built into them, which will allow you to put apps on them and you can watch these streaming platforms on your TV. Not every TV is created the same. There's a wide variety of operating systems that come with your TV. There's Google TVs, there's Amazon TVs, there's Roku TVs, um, Vita TVs. They're, they're all essentially kind of the same thing in that it's just a computer that allows you to download apps and run apps on it. If you own a smart TV, you don't need to go out and buy another device to plug into it to stream uh, content from. So if you have a Google Home TV or a Google Smart TV, you don't need to go and buy an Amazon stick or Apple TV and plug it in and use that as well. Your TV will run all the apps you need. Now you may have a smart TV and still consider buying a third party streaming device for a few reasons. Um, consistency is a big one. 
maybe you're an Apple fan and you've got your iPhone and your iPad and uh, your, your watch and you want Apple TV so that all your devices talk to each other. That's fair. Uh, you may find that your smart TV operating system doesn't accept the apps you want to use. For instance, I have a Roku TV and Bell provides my internet access. So I get Bell TV, but my Roku smart TV, I can't install the Bell app on to watch Bell TV on, which is kind of annoying. Um, so there are times when you may want to explore other options, but for the most part, I would say stick with the TV you've got, learn how the operating system works, and download the apps that you want to use directly onto your TV. If we just forget everything I just said, and we explore some of the streaming devices that are out there, I'll give you an overview of some of the more popular ones and ones that I would recommend. Uh, number one is gonna be the Roku device. Uh, until I owned a Roku TV, I had no idea why this was popular, and now I have them on all my TVs. So this is my favorite way to stream. First of all, they're very inexpensive. They're probably the cheapest ones you can buy on the market. Uh, number two, they are extremely easy to use. The menus are simple and straightforward. They're colorful. They're engaging. They don't throw a ton of ads in your face, which is nice. There is a really great app that you can put on your smartphone, which turns your smartphone into both a remote control but also into a headphone jack. So if you wanna watch TV at nighttime, you can plug your headphones into your phone, watch TV through that and turn the, the sound off on your TV and not disturb people in your home. Uh, Roku also has a on-demand and live TV service that comes with their devices. So you can watch Roku TV for free on their device. Um, they're unique channels. They're channels you won't find anywhere else, but often you'll find stuff that you like on it. If you're trying to turn something into a smart TV, the Roku is a good way to go. Another inexpensive option is the Amazon Fire Stick. Um, they're very, they plug right into the TV. They're nice and easy to use. They're voice controlled, which is nice. And if you are an Amazon Prime member and you buy one directly from Amazon, it'll show up to your house already programmed. There's nothing you need to do. You just plug it in, connect it to your Wi-Fi, and off you go. What's nice about the Amazon stick is you can download and put anything you want on it. Um, you can put video games on it. You can open up the internet browser on it. Um, it's Bluetooth capable. So if you want to connect a keyboard or Bluetooth headphones or something to it, you can do all of that. Um, some of the, the downsides for the Amazon stick is Amazon is a business that sells things. And that's very clear when you use one of their products. Uh, when you turn this on, you're going to be shown a whole bunch of movies and TV shows and apps and things that you aren't subscribed to that they're trying to get you to buy. And that can be kind of annoying. Overall though, it's still a pretty decent device. And at $30, it's not a, a major expense. On the other side of things, Apple devices, no surprise here, they're much more expensive than Android based devices. However, if you are an Apple user, I'm gonna have a hard time convincing you to spend less money because Apple products, they work so well together. Um, you're not going to have any issue if you are used to that Apple environment. This is their device. Those are kind of the major devices that are out there. I know that Google has their Chromecast device. It's very similar to the uh, Fire Stick and it costs more. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the other options that are out there. Now, I am not going to recommend any of these options to you. And I'll give you my reasons as I go, but they are very popular. I'm asked about them all the time. 
So I'm just going to give you some information about them just to, to make this a complete presentation. IPTV. Internet Protocol Television, I think that's what it stands for, uh, is a service that gives you access to TV channels from all over the world. There are apps that that service IPTV that basically look like a big TV guide, and there are thousands of channels to pick from. The way this typically works is you'll purchase a box from either off the internet or from a friend of a friend, and it comes preloaded with some apps, and you pay a monthly fee for these apps to keep the TV channels working on them. Uh, typically, they cost between $10 and $20 a month for the subscription. Now, you may be thinking this sounds wonderful. It's cheap and there's lots of content. What's, what's the downside? Well, there is a few. The way internet TV works is when you have this piece of software that's searching for links or streams, they're called. And it's looking for these streams, and some of them work, and some of them don't. Uh, it can be very annoying when streams don't work for you. You want to stay up and watch the Formula One Grand Prix race from the other side of the world, and all of a sudden that stream's not working. It can be frustrating. And there's no customer service on this box. You can't call anybody and complain that the link is down. The link is down, it's down. There's nothing anyone can do about that. If you've used these things before, another common headache is what I'm calling buffering or connection problems. And that's when you're watching something and the video freezes and it takes a couple seconds for it to load up and get going. You might get a little spinny wheel in the middle of your video waiting for it to load. That can be very, very frustrating. The other side of IPTV is the legal argument that goes with it. Now, I am not a lawyer and don't take my word as the gospel on this. Uh, I did speak to a lawyer about this and their feedback to me was currently in Canada, streaming is not illegal. So watching TV, streaming it is not it's not illegal to be doing this. However, as we speak, this is April of 24, um, Bill C-11 is in the government being read and it's the Online Streaming Act bill and it is looking to change this. So it could be by the time you see this video, if this act is approved, while it, in, it increases the amount of Canadian content that's going to be available for Canadians to watch, it also makes streaming devices like this illegal. So as I sit here right now filming this, these IPTV streaming is not illegal, but it may become that way very quickly. The other side of this is IPTV gives you the option sometimes to download the movies you're watching. And you can find a stream and download that episode of the TV show or download the movie. This is 100% illegal. This is a very clear distinction. Uh, if you possess a copy of copywritten material, so you have a file on your computer of that movie that's in the theater right now, you're in copyright infringement and you um, could face repercussions on that. So it is 100% illegal to be downloading movies and TV shows either through IPTV Often what will happen is if you do download something that you shouldn't have, your internet service provider will get involved. You'll get a letter in the mail saying you've downloaded something illegally and you could face repercussions for that. Another problem with IPTV, uh, and this is especially true if you're buying them online, and this is coming from whistleout.ca is an investigative site that looks into these things. Um, what they found in their investigation was a lot of the 
IPTV services that people buy online that claim to be from somewhere are actually um, coming from a different country. So they're using fake addresses and they're fa they found that the majority of IPTV providers that you connect with online are coming from either Vietnam or India. Uh, the laws are a little bit different there and you have to give your credit card to confirm your subscription for the IPTV service. And if the business is not being honest about where they're located, they may or may not be honest with your credit card information. So again, it's one of those beware things. I feel that a lot of the people I know that have used IPTV have purchased it locally and dealt with a person face to face. But with the way the laws are changing, I would be very apprehensive about recommending this as a way forward for anybody. Another piece of hardware you may have heard of, you may have experienced, is the Android TV box. Uh, I saw one of these in a trade show once upon a time and thought this was going to be the future. Spent way too much time teaching myself how to use it and dealing with the frustration when it didn't work properly. An Android TV box is essentially a little computer that you can put apps on, just like you'd put onto your smartphone. And there are some apps that allow you to stream TV shows and movies. Um, it's very similar to the way IPTV works. Uh, just it's a little more complicated and much more of a headache. What's nice about an Android box is you can put all kinds of things on it. You can put a web browser on it. You can put games on it. The reason I still have an Android box is because we play video games on it. And it's kind of fun playing them on the TV as opposed to on your cell phone. They range in price. And there's a picture here of what one typically looks like. Once upon a time, I used to say that these were, were great, but I've fallen out of favor with them. And the biggest problem with these things is that they constantly need to be updated. And I mean, two or three times a day sometimes to keep some of these apps working. And if you are not tech savvy, this is very frustrating. Uh, guaranteed, if you want to sit down and watch something, your box is going to have to update something before that happens. And if the app updates and changes the way things work, you have to teach yourself how it works again. Uh, the streams go down frequently. The streams disappear frequently. Like IPTV, there's no customer service. There's no one to call and complain. The same legal issues that affect IPTV are in play here as well. So in my opinion, if you're looking to explore alternatives to cable, steer clear of the Android box. It's too much of a hassle. This is something else I'm just going to touch on because a lot of people have asked me about it. Again, the majority of this stuff is not legal. So my recommendation is do not use these things um, at all. But a lot of people know what torrents are and what what's the deal? I want to know more about it. So if you remember back in the day when Napster came out and we all thought this was wonderful, we could start getting music this way. Um, it was an example of a peer-to-peer -peer sharing system, meaning I have a file on my computer, you want it, you use this piece of software to get it from me, you copy it from me. Torrance is kind of the evolution of that. What it does is it takes a file breaks it down into pieces, and then downloads those pieces from a variety of computers. So let's say I have a file and three other people have that file and you want that file. You'll download it and it'll take a piece from me and a piece from the other three people so you get it quicker. In a nutshell, that's how torrents work. Very simplistic way. Now, while file sharing that way isn't in itself illegal, the files that people download using torrents 
are illegal. So this is how people access movies and TV shows and things like that. Um, again, owning a copy of something that you haven't paid for legally, that you have downloaded using one of these pieces of software is 100% illegal and you shouldn't have it. The other thing that is very common with users of torrents is infecting your computer with malware, spyware, viruses. This is like one of the few ways you can still get a virus on your computer is if you're using corrupt torrent sites. The other thing torrents do, do is allow other users to access your computer. So if you have banking information and other things on your computer, you may not want other people to see. Having a torrent client open is kind of a way for them to gain access to your computer. So if you have used these programs in the past, I would suggest deleting them off your computer, to stop using them if you currently are. As far as the law is concerned, this, this, this is illegal. To wrap up, this has been a long one, so thank you for staying awake with me. In summary, for some folks, staying with cable may be your best option, depending what you watch. If you like major network TV, if you like sports, cable may still be your best option out there. It's going to be convenient. It's easy. It's There's no headaches involved other than the bill. It may be the best way to go. Uh, if you are able to access that Connected for Success program through Rogers, then do it because it's, it's saved money. Uh, $15 a month versus $150 a month for internet, that's a no-brainer. If you're looking to save some money, think about an antenna. If you like live TV, you don't care about getting every channel under the sun, an antenna might be something to think about. If you have the ability to install it on the side of your house, then great, you can get some TV shows for free. If you're looking at internet speeds, 100 megabytes a second is plenty. You know, anything, anything lower than that, if you live on your own, it's probably fine. If you have a big family of people that like to spend time online, maybe a little bit more. But unless you've got a really popular YouTube channel that you're uploading content to all the time, these huge packages that are out there are just overkill. You don't need that much speed. When it comes to the streaming uh, platforms, the Netflix and the things like that, only pay for what you're actually using. Uh, if you don't have a 4K TV, you shouldn't be paying for the premium service because you can't take benefit of, of the quality of the 4K stuff. Um, if you know you're not going to be around for six months, cancel the service. Don't pay if you don't need it. There's no cancellation fees. There's no startup fees. So only pay for what you're watching. Give something a break if you're tired of it. Try something new. Before going out and buying another device, Learn how the menus and the apps all work on your smart TV. You don't need a Google dongle or a Fire Stick if you are great with the Roku TV or the Vita TV, whatever. If you can figure that one out, don't go invest your money in something else. If you are looking for something and you want to keep things simple, my hands down recommendation is the Roku. It's cheap, it's easy, it's pretty. And the live TV stuff that they give you for free is a, is a bonus. Apple charges you 13 bucks a month to watch their Apple TV. Roku gives it to you for free. So if you're going to buy one, it's the one that I would recommend. If you're thinking about IPTV, really give it some thought because I personally feel that when the laws change, this is something that they are targeting and it's going to make streaming stuff like IPTV illegal. And we do not recommend anything illegal here. Um, just like downloading, that is black and white in the law. Don't download stuff anymore. And uh, if someone decides they want to sell you an Android box, take a pass on it. Unless you are ready for a headache or you love tinkering with computers, all the power to you. But it is a very frustrating piece of software now that there's so many other inexpensive and easy to use options out there. So that's my chat on, on video streaming. I hope you found it entertaining. We'll see you for the next one.